Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's live stream show. I'm hoping that the uh, sound is actually coming through my microphone this time, because last week's stream, it came through my webcam camera, and it was incredibly echoey um, the entire time. So happy days. You know, thank you for being here. Um, it's quite a lot of you. Hello to everybody that's in the chat. Good evening from Utah. Hello, Utah. Our guest tonight is also from Utah. Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight this comment that I thought was quite hilarious. Um, if at any point you need me to tell the story about when my uncle fought a tall white alien outside of Chippy in Manchester, just let me know. Um, I'm sure we'll be calling on that at some point throughout the show. I just want to um, say up front, um, a year ago today, I released my uh, documentary on Alternative 3, um, kind of gargantuan um, documentary. And I did find out today that um, Leslie Watkins, who uh, wrote the book um, Alternative 3, sadly passed away in February of this year. Um, so it was very sad to hear that, but I was really um, felt really lucky that I'd managed to speak to him um, before he passed. So um, yeah, just wanted to um, say that. So um, my guest this week is longtime investigative researcher and executive director of Expanding Frontiers Research, Erica Lukes. Erica is a lifelong resident of Salt Lake City, Utah, where she runs Total Body Pilates, a venue which has evolved to serve as a community hub for an ever-growing diverse range of purposes and activities, including housing special collection archives. She is a former state director for MUFON in Utah, and she hosted her own show, UFO Classified, before joining forces with Jack Brewer and Barry Greenwood to form Expanding Frontiers Research. Her previous interviewees on UFO Classified are a veritable who's who of ufology, the good, the bad, and the somewhat in between. Her work with Expanding Frontiers is more sceptical. She's definitely not afraid to call out bad actors when she sees them, while still grounded in a love for the strange and unexplainable. It's an honour to call her my friend, and I am so happy that she's my guest tonight. Please welcome Erica Lukes. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I am so happy the ladies are in the house tonight. <laughs> You're welcome. When I was on your show, you did like the nicest introduction for me. I can remember coming on and being like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. You've done that for me as well. And I'm really excited to be on the show. And it, like we were talking before the show began, it is, it, we need more women, objective women um, in this, this topic. It's Absolutely. time to make a, a change in that regard. Absolutely. And thank you for joining me here tonight. You are my first woman guest. Actually, yes. which is which is you know quite terrible, but yeah, unfortunately, it's, there's it's a small pool, you know, a of very women out pool. here, and I, I think, um, you know, it, especially um, people that aren't getting sucked up into certain um, ideas. You know, there are a lot of, as we know, women um, kind of the well. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not, not going to start the show off on that clunker. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can know just get straight into it. <laughs> we'll get accused be of good being like, like we'll get accused of being like man haters i guess if we start off the uh start <laughs> off the show like you know i definitely my, my best friends in the world are all all men you know i i love Absolutely. I, I know a lot of great people of both both sexes and so but as we know there are good things about both of them both sexes and bad so, things absolutely so. I completely agree. So I want to start off with um, what you probably get asked every time that you go on any sort of podcast, do any sort of interview. How on earth did you get involved in this strange world to begin with? Like, what was the thing that kind of like motivated you to be like, right, I am going to immerse myself in this? You know what? I was um, an only child, you know, and I grew up just reading books and and spending a lot of time, you know, watching Battlestar Galactica. Now that I've come out about my age, I can just be forthright <laughs> about, yes, I was alive during Battlestar Galactica, you know, the, all of that. But I mean, I grew up kind of watching these shows and I remember picking up a book off the library shelf when I was in grade school and it was, um, is something up there? And right. it was, you know, the UFO on the cover and I'm just like, whoa, you know, this is so cool. And, 
And, you know, you go, you read books about different topics in the paranormal. And I just, it was, it was fun. It was fascinating. And then in my teenage years, of course, there were the X-Files or not teenagers, a little bit older, but, um, well, maybe not, but, you know, so I got, you know, to grow up in this kind of era where the media was really promoting things like this. And then also, you know, um, Close Encounters and, and different movies, E.T., things like that. So it was, it was fascinating to me. And, you know, I picked up Communion and Red Bud Hopkins and mm -hmm. that. And so that was a very interesting thing that all these guys were making the rounds on talk shows. And so that gave them an air of credibility that clearly they shouldn't have had. Um, but you sort was, of you sort of came up in like this maybe golden age is the wrong term to put it, but you kind of it sounds like you kind of came up in this era where these conversations around UFOs, around topics like abduction, were very like prominent in popular culture. Yeah, it was. It was. You know, it was. It's always been very interesting. You know, and, and back in the '60s, I know it was pretty mm -hmm. common and I was uh, born in 69 so yes I will say it was the 70s version of Battlestar Galactica so and I thought Apollo was so cute but <laughs> <laughs> that's um you know it, it's it's a fascinating topic I think it captures everybody um in, in some way because there is is out there all, all these wonderful possibilities and you know as I've said before you can't look at what's what's out there and and be dumb enough to think there isn't another life form somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I just now fully believe after studying this pretty intensely for quite some time that the the versions that we've been told either by grifters or by the intelligence community or by people that have political motivations, you know, I don't believe that those um I don't believe that that extraterrestrials have landed on earth. I don't believe we have dead bodies and recovered <laughs> spaceships. I'm really sorry. So you guys go get your pacifiers. If you need one, get some warm milk and grab your blankie because <laughs> it's time for a reality. Lot them, a lot of them do need that though. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I feel like when you say that people immediately think that like you, when I say you, I mean like kind of like the collective you, you, me, everyone else that has said that people kind of think that, that we're saying um, that there is no sort of like strangeness or there is nothing that's unexplained. And it's like, no, what we're trying to say is a lot of the stories that are being told and have been told throughout the years, either through popular culture, through the news media, are false. And they're propagated and pushed by bad actors with nefarious intentions most of the time. Right. Or guys that never got a date in high school. So... <laughs> Now they're on the UFO circuit and cha cha cha. <laughs> Ooh, Richard Dolan's getting dates, you know. It, yeah, it just, yeah, it's weird, that isn't it? It's uh, there's a lot of um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like strange. I would say we okay. So we were talking about this. I'll go a little bit on Virgin going off my uh my script of topics, but we were talking a little bit beforehand about um. To give to give a bit of background for those that don't know, on on Twitter, UFO Twitter is a kind of uh, like kind of subgroup of people, and there's a new um, UFO Twitter account called Skyfi News. Skyfi News is being run by a couple of people on UFO Twitter, but one of them is Keemstar. And Keemstar is very, very well known, not for very good reasons. Um, if you've ever spent much time on YouTube, he's very much um, in kind of like the G YouTube drama sphere. Um, it's it's kind of content creators that don't necessarily create anything of worth. They just oh. kind of sit in front of the camera all day and then they have like beef with each other. So in a way, it is kind of similar to the ufology, I guess. Um, so if it, like, He's kind of taken this pivot um, from YouTube drama and like that kind of um, like content creation drama and kind of gone into UFOs. And it's not like the first time that ufology has had kind of like a gossip columnist. Like you could say, um, what's his name? Jim Mosley mm -hmm. um, and Saucer Smear was very much that. That was a publication that was around, gosh, from like the 60s right into the um, very early 2000s. And that was basically a publication. I'm just doing an explanation for because I get I get people in the comments that are like, we don't know what you're talking about. Explain yeah, it. Um, 
there was a publication that kind of detailed the kind of the dramas, the interpersonal relationships within ufology. And in this field, there is a lot of drama. Would you say that's a fair assessment? You know, I don't know what it is, the need for therapy. I mean, there, and it's like, come on now, we can maybe get a group discount. You know, let's, let's work on that. Um, but I, um, I think there is obviously a lot of drama and there are people that are popping up, especially right now. You know, we've, I've mentioned um, UAP caucus and some of these new uh, outfits that have come out of the blue and are not transparent about who they are on their mm-hmm. websites. They're uh, collecting information, you know, like Enigma. And, um, you know, I think those, these things are very suspect as are, you know, the Skyfire news. And when you look at the fact that they're promoting Andrew Tate, who was in prison uh, with his brother for uh, sex trafficking, that's what they're going to promote. Well, then you should mm, probably not pay attention to them. And, you know, I also see, unfortunately, there are a lot of good people that are trying to get involved in this and they don't understand the dynamics. And so I've Mm -hmm. seen people that have been kind of easily manipulated because, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gaining a platform. People are following me. And, they're not doing their due diligence. Like if you see somebody's, you know, little um, profile picture on Twitter, there, there might be meaning to it. And maybe you ought to look at some of the, some, what imagery means and mm-hmm. calling cards for white supremacists, calling cards for other people um, that don't have the best uh, motivations in mind. And so we need to be really careful right now. Absolutely. I completely agree. And like just just back on kind of like being a a woman in the field, I remember at some point, I think it was just after David Grush, the David Grush hearing last year. And there was a guy on Twitter um, that had taken a, a, I think it was like a photograph of all of the people that queued up to get into the David Grush hearing and reposted it on Twitter and been like, why are there no women in the field? This is all men. And uh, one of the guys replied to it saying, well, um, UFOs are things um, and men are more interested in things, whereas women are more interested in people. And I was like, first of all, what on earth does that even mean? (laughs) What does that even mean? But also, like, I I feel like there's more drama in the UFO subculture than like uh, an episode of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Like, it's genuinely like Bravo show levels of drama. (laughs) <laughs> it, you know, it is. I mean, it, it's just like, you know, and all it is is a bunch of, you know, dudes behaving badly. I'm just going to mm-hmm. say it, you know, it, and it was very fascinating to see, you know, the hearing, whatever you want to call that debacle, and to, you know, see the people that were obviously he had his, you know, the handlers were in the front row there. Um, I'm surprised Jeremy Corbell wasn't wearing a Fred Perry, but that's, you know, I'm sure he does in some, some days, but um, I think that, you know, then you see these, these certain influencers who are back there that, you know, come out of nowhere and have these huge platforms, you know, the, and it's just like, if people can't like figure this out and figure out that this has nothing right now, the UFO, the UAP, whatever we're calling it tonight, uh, that it doesn't have anything to do with the subject. This yeah. is all politically motivated. This is all, you know, right. Going to, it's going to ramp up now that we're in the middle of this election cycle, mm-hmm. a very pivotal um, mm-hmm. election for our country. And so people, I, I really think people should probably be, well, be very careful. And then also check your sources if somebody isn't transparent about who they are. Um, if a website is popping up and they're not transparent about who was behind the group, then that should raise a red flag. And by all means, please make sure you don't give your data to people that aren't transparent because there's a whole nother layer of, of security, cybersecurity going, you know, I mean, it's just these common things that people don't seem to look at when UFOs are involved. Absolutely. I don't know if you if you followed any of that Ashton Forbes guy, the MH370 a little bit guy, somewhat but he there was one it wasn't there like one stream he did where like someone like sent him like what they okay, again i'm probably doing a bit of inside baseball but for people that don't know ashton forbes is a re uh, i've used researcher and in inverted commas um and his uh topic of choice to spend his entire life researching is um mh370 the missing plane 
And he is a proponent of like, there, there was uh, the fake videos of like something spiraling around the plane and then zapping it out, which are supposedly fake have supposedly been debunked but according to him have not been debunked there was a whole stream when where someone had <laughs> sent him fake classified documents like fake documents that he thought was real and he opened them all on stream and he was going and he was doing this on a live stream i'm sure that there's clips out there where he's going i'm gonna die they're gonna kill me make sure that you're recording this chat like he was so convinced oh, that dear. he was being given classified documents that had like verified his entire theory that like something had zapped this plane, whether it be alien, whether it be some sort of secret technology. It's like so steadfast in it. And he's he's very much involved in that kind of um sky fire news realm of people. You know, and, I, and that's I mean, first of all, and the, you know, I've obviously you've seen the fake documents thing, I mean, for 70 years now, but I think um, he actually paid for them ten thousand dollars for fake documents. Who did he pay? I've got no idea because I haven't followed it that closely, but I saw it. I just saw it going around on a, on a UFO Twitter. It, paid that like, month. hello, dude. Like did if it you, on a live stream. Oh, that is so awkward. That is so it's awkward. Oh, insane, my Lord. Right? Oh, mercy. <laughs> and like, pretty literally, pretty. if you're, okay, so you're like, first of all, yeah, you're getting scammed, obviously, but you're paying that money to get fake documents and do you think if they were world documents that you wouldn't have a whole bunch of people lining up outside your door to confiscate those documents like what the frick that's why i just don't understand why people would even think that um corbell and knapp and those crew are even you know putting forward leaked documents you know that yeah. just wouldn't it wouldn't happen it doesn't yeah. happen that way people go to yeah. prison you yeah. know yeah. and so and if those documents have been released, then they would have been released for some kind of purpose. So say even if the documents were real, as in they did come from some sort of government source, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, what you think they are. Right. And you could be being used for an ulterior motive. Let's just say that. Yeah. Getting back getting back to the topic. So you kind of grew up in this in this era of like uh, UFOs being very much involved in popular culture. But what, what was the point that you were like, I want to get involved in this myself. I want to research myself. You know, I think it was um, back in probably 2013, you know, I'd seen, you know, I'd love to look at the night sky and I had seen a couple of things that I thought were unusual. And so, you know, and so I wanted to research, find out what things were. I, you know, we live in Salt Lake. We're 70 miles away from Dugway Proving Ground. Um, and, you know, this, what I was observing, which I now believe to be totally explainable, was um, in the flight corridor for the International Airport. And so I wanted to know what it was. And mm -hmm. I wanted, I went on this learning, you know, process. I want to learn the, where the flight corridors are for the international airport. I want to learn what objects look like at night and how visual, you know, uh, your perception of things um, can change. Um, and I, I just, I went on that down that rabbit hole and then I decided to become a little bit more active and joined MUFON and then had, what you is, know. What oh. is MUFON for people that don't know what MUFON is, have MUFON, never heard of it before oh. in their lives? Yeah, it is the Mutual UFO Network. And it's the allegedly, or it was at one point, the largest international organization that uh, doesn't really do much but collect money um, and data and then sell it to the highest bidder but uh, and then promote, you know, rubbish. But so <laughs> that's MUFON for you. Um <laughs> And it's been around for, you know, like what, since the 69, I believe, 70. Um, so people oh. report report UFO events to MUFON. Yes. So say, say I'm, I, I live in Utah, I would then find my local chapter of MUFON report that way or that I could become involved in the organization that way. Yeah, um, you could, you know, find a local chapter, usually s submit a report to the big database um, that, as we know, is so, is so not secure. But um, and so then um, an investigator will get back to you and right. or not. And then either tell you that you've been abducted by the tall whites and you're here to save the world or, um, you know, whatever they're they're going to do. But not a lot of um, there are a few good people, I will say in the organization 
Um, but I think for, I think the majority, it's just a, you know, I just, I, yeah, it's, it's uh, not a good or it's, they've done nothing. Mm -hmm. They've mined people's data. They've mm -hmm. sold it to, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, crazy pants down in Vegas. Who um, is Mr. Crazy Pants oh, down in Vegas? You know, <laughs> But, who is again? I'm going to make you do this the whole yes, time. Yes, who's Robert, Robert Bigelow. Bigelow for people who don't know? <laughs> okay, yes, this is exactly good, and I love that about your interviewing <laughs> skills. Um, Robert Bigelow is, um, he's got to be getting up there in the years now, but mm -hmm. he is a real estate tycoon. He is also yeah. one of the biggest donors, uh, to the Trump campaign. Um, mm -hmm. he's been a longtime ally of Trump, uh, and he claimed uh, many years ago that he had uh, an encounter. There was something that, that his origin story, he created an origin story. Um, I don't believe his origin story because nothing that comes out of his mouth seems to be very um, credible in my opinion. This is, you know, why he loves me. They love me so much. Um, but, you know, so he's, he's mining data. He buys this property, Skinwalker Ranch, which is right outside of Vernal, Utah back in the 90s and um, just created through the help of, of George Knapp, um, a wonderful and Colm Kelleher, this, this story about a ranch that's allegedly, you know, got portals where big hairy beasts are walking out and they're bulletproof wolves and, and all of this um, really great stuff. And so Bob Bigelow is, is the, he had an aerospace company. I, that aerospace company is no longer, um, around anymore mm -hmm. and definitely uh he is he's very heavily involved in politics so yeah interesting guy mentions to stanford research institute or kind of linked in with um a lot of the people that were involved in the um stargate project at stanford research institute that's people like how put off um I've kind of mentioned those in, a, in those kind of people in um, a few of, of my videos. But you say that, um, so a, a lot of people will will have only kind of heard of Skinwalker Ranch via um, Brandon Fugel's TV show, which is like, I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want to compliment the man, but in terms of like creating, you know, like re perfect reality TV, it works so well it's one of those shows that you can just kind of watch you because you, you watch reality TV to kind of switch off. Right. And it's one of those shows where you really do just kind of like switch off to watch it. And they do create the entertainment factor, but they also um, try to give themselves a um, veneer of scientific credibility um, with, with, you know, their, their massive um, control room where they, <laughs> they monitor everything that's going on on the ranch. Brought to you by Home Depot. <laughs> I, I think like a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the people that kind of believe this Skinwalker Ranch story, they think that it's, it, it is related to like, um, more kind of like ancient stories, also like, um, indigenous, uh, like, um, I'm not quite sure what the word I'm searching for is, like legends, indigenous legends right, around right. around skinwalkers and stuff. But isn't it true that there really is like no connection to and all of that is like completely artificially Absolutely. created? Right. Yeah. Right. And I mean, that's the thing. If you just do like a little bit of research, then first of all, you it's like, okay, where did this origin story come from? That it was cursed. You know, there's Skinwalker Ridge, and well, guess what? You know, um, I I was lucky enough in my life to know one of the world's foremost Native American historians um, that worked at the University of Utah for many, many years. And he actually grew up in this area. And um, I approached him about this and he was just like, no, right. <laughs> sorry. You know, this is, you know, the, the Navajo, uh, that was something that um, is talked about, um, but it's not a Ute. This is right. This is abutting a Ute tribe. Uh, a, a Ute um, reservation. And so again, it's like you have this group of white guys picking up these bits and pieces of truth to fit their convenience. They're not yeah. even respectful enough to actually do real research, but here we are, you know, now we've got this new, um, I guess it's not new. I think it's the fifth season TV show mm -hmm. again with a bunch of, uh, you know, guys with lasers and um, whatever they're doing um, out there. And, and like you said, the, the, their little war room where they're, 
you know, we've got big screens. Oh my Lord, there's a big screen. Yeah. It's got to be scientific. Some... It's very similar to like, um, like the, a lot of the uh, haunting stories that people will say, oh, well, the house was built on an indig indigenous burial ground. Not only deeply offensive, but I'm fairly certain that the person that came up with that whole like theory in the first place was just like a, a non-indigenous person. I'm like 99% certain. Um, so it's kind of exploiting like, I'm, I'm going to get like too political about it, but not only are you know on the land, but you're also exploiting the folklore, completely twisting it and right. then like making a totally fake story out of it for your own financial gain. Right. And Basically. cultural mis misappropriation. I mean, it, and that's, it, that is definitely, you know, something that has taken place with regard to the ranch. And I think it's pretty interesting that nobody has really ever called that out but you know yeah. again it that is a part of uh utah where things happen and lots of stuff doesn't get called out that is not above board um so Absolutely. it's but it's it's yeah it's it's too bad because um it, a, lot, a lot of people including myself were kind of sucked into this narrative mm. and then you start to do research and things don't add up and you see that there are always questions and and promises of transparency and and nothing ever comes you know into fruition just like the, the ufo right. story in general um like elizondo's claims and some of those people you know it's a lot of talk and a lot of distraction and oh no it's coming next year um yeah, but nothing absolutely. ever comes of it and i think it is really also very suspect that um, the ranch, the people involved with the, the alleged scientific research aren't openly sharing their data. And mm -hmm. I know that they can, you know, say that they are, if you join their member, you know, members only club, so you can go, you know, watch them sit around and, you know, do whatever they're doing. But I think it's, you know, it's, there's, that's not, it's not called science, what they're doing. It's called creating right. a TV show and, and making myths. And at, at the end of the day, this is, people are getting hurt people are believing things that are fictitious mm -hmm. and that you know at some point in time people need to take responsibility for the information that they're putting forward to the public absolutely so uh, rob bob bigelow robert bigelow whatever you want to call him he owned skinwalker ranch and then he then sold that on to brandon fugel right. who is another massive real estate mogul in utah right like he certainly claims yeah i mean he's definitely he's definitely up there in terms of affluence um depending so on like, who he is <laughs> <laughs> a well, good thing isn't it well he kind of he drives he well he puts on a veneer of it at least yes. you know he drives around in in his ferrari and um but he also makes sure to let you know that um he's a very humble guy because he goes to the same gas station every day to get his uh, diet mountain Dew. <laughs> Such a wow, the humanity God. but wasn't it wasn't it how put off that was involved in like brokering that deal between that was my understanding yeah robert bigelow mm -hmm. because and it was through their connection with was it joe famage was was somehow involved in in this you know i mean he was involved with another um project that mm -hmm. um was a huge dud the little gyroscope mm -hmm. uh Thing that they were creating um, and and you know scammed people out of uh, money and and I'm I, when I'm I'm you know there it's yeah the whole thing is interesting it's just been one grift after the other after the other with um, this certain group of people and so it's, so when we yeah. say this uh, this certain group of people we we, we mean Robert Bigelow How Put Half the characters that, that always seem to pop up. And these are also characters that oscillate around um, more uh, like modern, because because if you're familiar with 80s and 90s ufology, you probably would have heard of the, and you know, going back to the 70s as well with SRI, you probably would have heard of these people. But more modern um, iterations of, of like a UFO disclosure activist, whatever you want to call them, David Grush. But he's very much in that sphere you know he's on you know first name basis with Hal Puthoff it's just Ooh. all of the same characters I know it is I mean and it's just to me I so I um was on Facebook the other night and I saw a thread where 
uh, people were talking about, oh my gosh, I talked to Eric Davis and no, he's telling, he's telling the truth and no, it's so cool. You know, I mean, people that I would think would know better than this. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, they're, all these people have put out such garbage over the years. And if you really listen to them closely, their stories change over the years and it's, yeah. and they've got nothing to back it up. And so they do, have, they have been involved in a lot of hoaxes in the UFO subject that I'm sure at, you know, at the, you know, on the end of the day that um, they will, history will reveal their true motivations and it won't be a, a good look for them, but they probably won't care because they will have accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. Absolutely. I agree. Um, just to um, just address something in the chat. Um, I wish I'm not here. This isn't happening. I wish we could no donations or super chats. I just realized that's because I didn't turn it on, but I have turned it on now. Um, but you're under no obligation uh, whatsoever. It was very nice of you to ask. Um, so going back to MUFON Day. So you joined MUFON. And from there, you, you become the state director for Utah. So what was that kind of like trajectory like? So it was at the time that I became involved, there wasn't really somebody here in Utah that was, you know, it, taking, was actively involved. Um, actually, there were a couple of people, let me uh, just state that. But it, the, the um, group was in, in shambles because of what had happened with Elaine Douglas. And Elaine Douglas okay. was the director before uh, before I, I came in. Um, and then, you know, she had left uh, MUFON in a big in a big way. But so I had to kind of get everything going again. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because Elaine Douglas is, a, an in, I feel like we're going to have so many different things to talk about, like so many little tidbits, because you just mentioned a name and immediately like, I'm got, I've got a, question about that because Elaine Douglas um she pops up in some of my research um some research that I've been doing around um John Ford right who was um he had tried to and if we want to talk about extremism within ufology the John Ford case is probably I, I'm surprised that not many people talk about it um he's still under a psychiatric hold um Good. He was a guy who rang the Long, Long Island UFO network um, and he was very much involved with kind of Preston Nichols and the whole Montauk crowd. And um, he essentially, um, how do I explain this succinctly? He created a plan um, with a bunch of uh, people, like two or three other people, um, to poison um, the uh, local Republican politicians with uh, uranium. It was like uranium. He was going to spray. Oh, they were going to sprinkle it in um, in their cars. They were going to put it in their toothpaste. They were going to put it in their food. Um, and it's interesting because some of the people that he actually was trying to poison with uranium um, late, later went to jail themselves for corruption. There was like loads of stra there's loads of strange things about going on in Long Island. It's very bizarre. But Elaine Douglas, who you mentioned, um, she was a massive defender of John Ford. She was. And she, yeah, she wrote, I've seen a few of her articles in MUFON journals where she is defending him vehemently. And um, a few other people, there was a, a Harry Hepcat, who's a rockabilly um, singer in Long Island, but he was also part of the original Long Island UFO network with John Ford. And he was like, he wrote like a rebuttal to her defending him just being like this guy was like a little he, i think he called him like a mini napoleon claimed oh, that good. john Ford tried to kill people before that he'd sexually harassed women there was like a lot of uh, of like a lot of stuff but elaine yeah, does pretty powerful for the course in this subject oh, doesn't it absolutely we just don't like to talk about it we just like to keep inviting people like that back to our conferences to speak of course, of course, because, you know, we might as well just we'll bring them all back. We'll bring all of the child abusers and yes. all of, all, you know, all the people with domestic violence claims. We'll just bring them all in and then put them in front of a, a group of people that are very susceptible to what they're hearing. So we're going to run. <laughs> it just starts running. But go back to Elaine Douglas, because I, I want to know more about her leaving MUFON and, and what the... 
what the deal was. Then. So she really was looking at, um, she was digging into Bigelow and had made a lot of um, connections and was asking questions about why, you know, why this third party was coming in, what his motivations were and different things like that. And so that raised a lot of um, red flags. And of course they didn't want anybody to know. And she was pretty, she was pretty strong willed and had a lot of ideas, you know, obviously supporting a person like John Ford isn't a good look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she, you know, later died of uh, brain cancer, I believe. And so very controversial figure. Mm -hmm. um, it is unfortunate I was set to get her files, um, which would have been really important to, to people in Absolutely. Utah, I think, to understand what was going on, what had gone on. Um, but a, a series of events happened and a couple of people stepped in to make sure I didn't get them, which was, you know, unfortunate. But, you know, what what secrets those files would have told at the end of the day? Do you think that was, you don't have to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you think that that was motivated because unlike other people who may take those files, keep them kind of under lock and key, you would have been very transparent with it? Do you I think, think that they that was were, motivation? Yes, I think, you know, I think there were a lot of, things that went into that. I think it was um, a, a specific person who just doesn't have good motivations to begin with. I think that people realized that if I would have gotten a hold of them and because I was asking questions and challenging people, that that wouldn't have been a good a good thing um, for me to have yeah, those documents. And so that was, um, you know, <laughs> unfortunate. And also the woman that had the documents, you know, was pretty questionable, um, in my opinion, and didn't, you know, felt like she was holding these little pearls of wisdom, which she, she very well could have been, she probably was, but mm -hmm. she wanted to play games with that. And, right. you know, I think that's really unfortunate. You're either doing this for, to preserve history or to help research, um, or to, to Completely. make sure that a person's memory is carried on, or you're playing games like a little twit in the sandbox. Absolutely which, yeah. you know, it clearly happened here. It was just ridiculous. But, um, but you know, it's okay. I don't have her files, but I have, I do a lot of digging and I'm sure I can find out information just as good, if not better. Yeah, absolutely. So you take over her role as the, the state director. You know, I did, there was a fellow that was there in the, in the interim and there was also um, a state director from back east that was kind of managing that as well. And so right. I came in and, and tried to to get people involved again um, in the subject. And and I did a good job getting the MUFON chapter started back up. And and we had great meetings and, and things like that. And it was also interesting to me, too, that we, we did not get a lot of reports in Utah. Right. At least that we could see. Which is strange because of, like you said beforehand, I just want to say thank you um, for this super chat. Much appreciated. You guys don't have to, but it's that is really lovely and so generous and much appreciated. Um, as you were saying, there was a there's a lot of uh, of like military activity there. A lot of like like you you said like Douglas Proving Ground. There's um there's definitely other. Um, I'm not sure about Air Force bases. Yeah, we have uh, Hill Air Force Base and then also the NSA uh, storage right, facility. Right. Um, so you would assume that there would be like quite a lot of, of activity. I mean, you you would, um, you know, and I think there are a lot of reasons why there wasn't. Maybe people are just so, you know, focused on looking forward that they didn't look up. Maybe there was, maybe, maybe um, when cases were reported, they were siphoned somewhere else. Um, which right. we know happens in MUFON, I think, pretty mm -hmm. regularly. Uh, and and maybe the military did step in for reasons of national security to try to get some of these sightings, um, you know, out of the public yeah, eye. Yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely. That's quite interesting when you think about it. Like it one, makes you wonder, kind of what what collusions there are because that you know throughout the the history of UFO organizations there's always kind of been the, not in all of them but there if most of them the big ones there always seems to be some sort of like you know relationship with military with intelligence so i wonder if that's that was kind of a, a thing that was going on there you know it, 
yeah, there's there are a lot of questions about that. I mean, I we we definitely have a lot of a lot of things here in Utah that are um, you know of, of, of importance to national security and mm -hmm. and so hopefully, I mean, I hope that people are the right people are paying attention to to some of these things um, because I know that you know I love Utah as much as I complain about it. I have the right. I've been here, but you know, I mean, I you know I care about what what happens to my community to this you know everything so i just absolutely you know I, I care about that and i will say like i had a few years ago i had a really interesting case that came in and this was it was incredible but i um, got a phone call from a local reporter and she had said okay erica we're getting all of these you know phone calls and reports on our social media site about there um, were these white spherical objects that were hovering over Salt Lake, um, Salt Lake mm -hmm. Valley during the day. You know, it was like 12 o'clock to two o'clock. And from my understanding, they actually did divert um, some of the air traffic at the time and social media just blew up. And then the next day, these objects were reported over in Breckenridge, Colorado. Right. And so I started, you know, finding, okay, who's posting what on social media, reaching out to different people, taking, going to different places, uh, where they had seen the objects and interviewing them and things. And some people reported that the objects were hovering in place, you know, for upwards of an hour. Um, right. It was very interesting because there were several of these five to seven. Um, some witnesses reported there were, uh, they were being followed or they felt it was being monitored by um, military aircraft. Wow. And so it was very, very interesting. I did um, a FOIA request for any of the the flight uh, FAA um, radar data, and the first time we got back unreadable text format, and then a couple years after that, when I had um, had my United or the uh, yeah, United, I'm trying to remember now, my American Airlines case that was right. quite interesting as well. I had someone from England to relook at the the data and he could pull out bits and pieces enough to see that there was a, an increase in military presence during that time period um, in the airspace and stuff. And so that was really fascinating. I was told um, by people in MUFON, higher ups in MUFON, that it was nothing that they were Google loon balloons. And when I you know, contacted the FAA and tried to to do some digging in that regard. There were no Google loon balloons that were in flight in North America during that time period. These objects did not have transponder data. And so it was a really interesting thing to have, you know, here you've got this a great mass sighting here, mm -hmm. and yet people at MUFON are trying to, no, no, nothing to see here. Which and, that's just that that in itself just makes you think, you know, like that's your whole purpose. You are the you're you're the mutual UFO network, and you're not interested in a, in in a UFO sighting that maybe actually has some data behind it. Yeah, it was Odd. very very interesting to me that how quickly it was dismissed, even though you know there things did not add up. You know, and my so, skeptical brain just goes. There was someone there that was working for the military that was like, "Well, oh, put that one to the side. Forget yeah, about then, that. Don't mention you know, that. And it was interesting because there was a reporter from from Colorado, Matt Renew, and you can go to YouTube and find the, the this news story that he did about the series of sightings over Colorado and how he went to NORAD and he went to different places and 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 was getting nothing. And it it does remind me, you know, now of the Chinese spy balloon. Mm. saga you know i mean were were we testing something was this a foreign mm. adversary it mm. was it was very very interesting and one of those things that you just don't hear a lot about probably by design but absolutely and i think like i, I think that's an important point to touch on as well is there's a lot of disdain i think in the ufo world for skeptics because uh, there, there seems to be like a reputation that like we don't believe that people have seen something. And it's like, I absolutely believe that people have seen something, but I don't think that people can necessarily prove what it is, right? And that means that it's just worthy of investigation. It doesn't mean you have to have a definitive answer. Um, but there can, there's a lot of like, you know, just real like nastiness around, around the idea of like being skeptical, which to me 
that's always been like the thing even in like you know even if you're involved in any sort of like conspiracy research like, like skepticism is like a thing to have right it's a skill it's a critical thinking skill you're able to kind of read between the lines and look at different sources of information and then judge but it's just surprising to me sometimes that a field that is so like very like conspiracy minded mm -hmm. is also very like one like very like uh what's what am i looking for like kind of um what am i, what am I trying to say black and white like yeah you, you know like they've got the blinders on you know you know it, it is interesting and i think you know you see this in jack and i've talked about this a million times but you see you know you've got these these camps and you're a skeptic and i think there are just as many problems with some of the things the skeptical people mm -hmm. um do mm -hmm. because they're only looking at things you know, in a very limited capacity, they're not looking at mm -hmm. some of the other games that are going on with the intelligence community, with people who are politically motivated. And, and they're, you know, I mean, great, we can debunk this, this video, you know, but at the end of the day, like, what were, what are the motivations for that group? You know, there, there are larger issues that skeptics don't want to touch. And I think that's, um, <clears throat> you know, rather, you know, cowardly in, in a way, but We've got another super chat. I will reiterate, you do not have to give a super chat, but I do appreciate it. It's so generous. Thank you so much. Um, this is from Tana, who says, uh, Erica, any advice for a first-time MUFON conference goer? Um, take lots of pictures. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? You'll have fun. I, If I went, I mean, I would love just for fun um, to go to another MUFON conference. I mean, I'm sure... That could be an interesting, you know, reception, probably a lot like James Carrion got when <laughs> he had left MUFON. But, um, you know, it's just, it's interesting to watch the dynamics. It's interesting to to see, you know, what what they're they're talking about and, and things. So it's, it's definitely worth, you know, it'll be interesting, you know, just have fun with that one. Yeah, definitely. I think, I, I think those kind of, I mean, I've never been to one and I would love to go. I feel like those kind of smaller local ones could be more um in more kind of like interesting than these kind of massive contact in the desert type um UFO conferences where it's really, you just pay like 500 600 dollars and you don't get anything. You know, you don't get to whereas like the smaller ones I can imagine they they're a little bit more like you you can do a bit more people watching which especially in this field is like one of the things I'm interested in what in you know the phenomena of it and and the reports, but I'm also very much interested in the people and um, the subculture element of it. And I can imagine that um, that uh, that this is uh, and and he says uh, the small one I'm going to has the guy who made national news for being a racist. Well, give him my best. Yeah, it's great. That give that kind of gives you. <laughs> that gives you an idea of uh, of of what it's like within MUFON. So, what was it like when you were MUFON stage director? So what was kind of like a, a, just a kind of there probably wasn't a regular day, but maybe just like give us a flavor of kind of what you would do as a MUFON state director. You know, it it was interesting. I just want to go back um, because it was mentioned that he did uh, John Bentry did make national news. There was an article mm -hmm. in Newsweek about what was going on with MUFON, and that also included statements from myself about the, the sexual harassment um, right. in in the subject. So that's a good article to, to look into. Um, you know, a typical day would be, you know, getting online, getting into the database, seeing what was coming in, calling, um, interviewing people, organizing meetings, you know, just, um, I also worked with the um, executive director and, and headquarters because I had hoped that I could maybe make a difference in getting a different dynamic, a different group of people involved in the subject, because I felt they were catering to old white guys, which they were, <laughs> you know, and, and I, you know, I thought we need, I thought we could do something. You know, that's one of the reasons I started my show, my very mm -hmm. first show. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I could, I, you know, it was it just, yeah, it was interesting. I am, um, had a couple great cases uh, that I'm very proud of. Um, and I don't know what it is. It's not ET, I will say, but I, and I made some friends. Um, but at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the level of 
despicable games and the bullying and harassment were just, it was just, it was too much and headquarters had no, they didn't care one way or another what happened, you know, within that regard. And so my state director, assistant state director at the time, Jeff Cox, um, and I resigned together. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about about like what the environment was like and kind of the harassment? Only if you feel comfortable. Yeah, no, I um, I think it's important to talk about. I um was I had done you know I was doing a, a show um, a show that I was paying for, um, and interviewing people from MUFON. I was asked to attend and speak at my first conference, um, Paula Harris's conference on behalf of MUFON, and I noticed that in the behind the scenes chat some of the people were saying things that weren't, weren't very nice. Um, and so I went to the executive director and the head of communications and I said, how would you like me to handle this? I've been told I can't interview people on my own show that I'm paying for. This is what's going on. I have to represent the organization. Can you step in and, and, and help me out? Give me you know, advice on this. And they went straight to uh, the person that was saying these things. This person called up and for you know, 20 minutes, just said I was an effing whore. Um, that I would, I mean, just on and on and on, and then publicly Amazing. on social media and um, all of these things. And I was just obviously in tears. Um, and because I, you know, I'm I'm professional. I'd like to be professional. And and if I'm representing an organization, I want to make sure I'm doing you know my job to do that. And it's um, the lack of response just was really, it showed me that MUFON was really being run by people that were, um, had a lot of problems. Yeah. So, and nobody, nobody needs that. If you can't stand up for that kind of sexual harassment and bullying in an organization, a nonprofit, then, you know, you have no business being a nonprofit in my opinion. Absolutely. Are they a, are they a nonprofit? Yes, of course. We're not quite <laughs> sure how or why. That's funny. That's but... funny because they're definitely profiting because they, you know, their Project Aquarius archives that they've put online. You have to pay fifty dollars for the year to get access to that. So you know, they're definitely and and there's you know all the other stuff. When you you know you look, you know, I mean, you look at the, the tax records and things, and you when you're doing that, you know, also look at the tax records for Orange County Move On. Look at some mm -hmm. of the other you know, um, big, big time, uh, allegedly nonprofits and their taxes. And it's like, okay, wow, this is really, really interesting. But, um, you know, people, there are, there, there are a lot of interesting things that can go on when people have creative means of accounting and things. <laughs> We're just going to leave it at that creative yeah. means, <laughs> creative means of accounting. So, um, Oh, there you go. This is a, it's an interesting comment. It's like what the bent to your advice being religion is all about tax exempt state. You're probably right about that. They really yeah. probably need to use that one. That's a good probably. one. Yeah. So um, tell me about setting up UFO Classified because um, I know you through the show that you do now, which is Expanding Frontiers. And we'll get on to talking about what Expanding Frontiers is um, in a little bit. But I know you through that, and I know you've kind of had you have like UFO researchers on, but they're they're not. It's very difficult to explain. They're they're kind of like a if, if ufology is a niche, the people that you have on your show are like the niche within the niche. Right now, mm -hmm. you have a lot of like skeptical thinkers, a lot of people that have like a love for the field, but have kind of you know fallen out of of love with them um, the culture. But UFO classified. When I kind of scroll back. I went through and I, I was like, oh, my God, we've got John Alexander. Oh, we've yes. Got, we've got people like Chris Bledsoe. I mean, I was like, bloody hell, she's had everyone on. Like, you, you spoke yep, to everyone. I have. I, yeah, I need to go back and, and do some, you know, pull some different You've you know, got an archive quotes. there of your own work that's, yeah. you know, like the, these conversations that you had. So tell me how, how that started, UFA classified and and how you kind of got talking to these very prominent people in ufology. So I started, my first show was UFO Audit. Just clever names right here, let me tell you. And then um, I left, I broke, obviously I, I didn't, I was no longer with that, the first um, network, I use that term loosely, that I was involved with. And then 
Um, I started another, was it you? I don't even remember. I think it had multiple names over the years. And then I was doing it on um, a couple of different platforms. And then I decided to um, go with um, a woman in Nevada, in Nevada. And I was, I started UFO classified there and um, had a good run of it and did interview a lot of people. And I could get a lot of these guests because back in, in that time period, I was much more of a believer and <laughs> mild, pretty mild mannered um, in my demeanor. And, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how many of these people would actually come on the show now. I mean, maybe, you know, a few of them would, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if I'd ask them, but, um, so I just, you know, I, I, I love talking to people. Like mm -hmm. I love whether I agree with somebody or not. Like I love hearing their stories. Like, why did they get involved? How did the subject affect their family life? How was their, their time in the subject changed over the years and their viewpoints? You know, mm -hmm. I think all of these things are really fascinating. And I also am very glad that I did get a lot of these people on record and, um, you know, specifically people like, um, my uh, dear friend, Gordon Lohr, who was the secretary um, for NICAP back in the sixties. Um, and so, and he was, you know, he um, passed away a couple years ago, but a lot of these people are older and they, you know, just don't, people don't understand their importance in the history of the subject. So I'm very proud mm -hmm. of some of the people that I, I interviewed and then encouraged to, to get out there and be in the spotlight and to preserve their history. So, and thanks, Steve, for the nice compliment. Absolutely. And it really does. It, that is the great thing about it is it does show your evolution into a, a more kind of, like I, like I keep saying, love for the field, love for the topic, but a, but a real kind of just critical thinking about it. And it's, and I also think like, like I mean, I, like last year, for example, I was going to do a video on um, Anjali, right? The um, the supposed contactee. I ended up not doing it, but I did a series of interviews where I spoke to her. I spoke to a lot of people involved, and I do still think that it's important to talk to people. I think there's some people you could probably not bother talking to because you don't need to. But I still am an advocate for um, a, a kind of a skepticism that isn't like. I don't know how to put it because because I kind of towed a line between this sometimes of being a bit kind of abrasive and in your face, being like, this is my opinion. This is some bullshit going on right now. <laughs> and then also like wanting to talk to people because I find it interesting. So it's like people like I, I, like the number one thing, guy that was on UFA Classified that really, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you spoke to him was John Alexander. Because to me, he's kind of like this creepy uh, kind of... Uh, like figure that looms over everything and i'm like but i but i would find it interesting to talk to him even you though what, I'm he was very interesting and he um what you know was uh, was always very cordial i know that um you know he um you know called uh there was a book uh review that he was supposed to do and he called um to talk with me about that and so i've always had you know I've, he's always been very respectful um mm -hmm. but he is an, a very interesting fellow you know yeah. that hangs around some of the usual suspects and so i was yeah. i was happy to have him on yeah he's he is very so um from how did you like uh, make the so you lit you left move on you, so you state director at move on left move on at that point did you have like a break where you were like, I need to get away from this. this no, stuff for a while. Yeah. nope. It was just, you know, I mean, it was business as usual. Just I didn't wasn't um, encumbered with that kind of um, dragging me down thing. And it mm -hmm. was, you know, that was when I really became more active in the archiving and had different donations mm -hmm. that were coming in. And then I was doing research and then got involved with some of the Skinwalker players. Um, as of late, and I don't remember what year I left MUFON. Um, 2015, 16, I don't, yeah, I right. don't remember. I should, but clearly it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> one of those things that I wrote down in my diary, but. So once you leave, kind of what, uh, uh, you 
eventually set up Expanding Frontiers, which is a pretty a pretty new venture. But in in that period, I'm assuming there's you know like you know just kind of kind of it's almost a a, a kind of unlearning, right? Like I I know that there's a lot of other things that have happened. I we won't want to talk about them. It's totally up to you whether you not you talk about them or not. But in terms of like UFOs specifically, was do you feel like there was a period? What what am I trying to say? Did did the experience that you had at Mufon kind of snap you out of it, or was it like a slower period of like picking things apart? You know, I mean, it was that was the the beginning of mm-hmm. you know questioning everything that I'd been told. Um, I think you know then and then you know to add in the Skinwalker mm-hmm. um, stuff and and being involved um, with some of the you know these characters and really learning you know, and, and questioning and seeing that the narrative wasn't reliable and seeing that there were their mo- motivations. Um, and, you know, that was the whole thing. It was like a shamanic dismemberment is really right. what it was like having your, you know, being tossed out in the, the desert and, and, you know, having your, you know, guts torn out of you. And then you've got to figure things out because everything that, you know, I had hoped for or believed in was a complete lie. Mm. And I'm a very trusting person to a fault. I've learned a lot, thank goodness, over the years. But I I never would have guessed when I got involved in this that there were so many people running the show with really, um, with Ill, Ill intent. And I didn't, you know, those were lessons that I had to 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 learn. And it really is the, the group of people involved in the higher levels of this are very shady. Mm. Um, and... So, yeah, those were things you learn and, you know, you get a lot of pushback when you're speaking out about these topics, you know, that's, there's a lot of money going around. Um, yeah. And it's people's um, entire living. Yeah. A lot right. of the, you know, I think we were saying when I was on your show, we were talking about people like Linda Moulton Howe. This is, uh, and Linda Moulton Howe is a UFO researcher, most, most known notably for, um, really kind of pushing the cattle mutilation um, stories um, or cases. Um, but but people like her, like that's her whole life. That there is no other career. And, and, and I guess when you think about it like that, it's, um, you know, you're almost, when you start speaking out about some of these people, it's almost as if, you know, you're kind of threatening their their pension, you know, like their retirement fund. Right. Because, yeah. like, you know, if, if the house of cards falls, then there's nothing. What do you do then? Do you, do you, you know, you have to go get a regular job just like everybody else. You, you know, but, do but they don't because they, they're, they're you know, I mean, that's like with the, the Travis Walton thing, you know, I mean, it's like you can give people all of this evidence and say, here it is. And then they've got it so, you know, jacked in their favor that they can, oh, that's a conspiracy. And, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard I'm in the dark cabal. You know, I think, um, oh, what's this bucket? Little Lord Fauntleroy. Um, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? David Wilcox. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, but I think I was, yeah, uh, you know, just, I you know, I'm, or, or I'm... One, at one point in time, I was on Bigelow's payroll, you know, all of these oh, things. God. I bet he wishes I was. Um, but you know, well, David Wilcox said that. Oh wow! Yeah. Did you? What interactions did you have with him? You know what? I don't even remember like why that came out at the time um, that it did. But it was just like and he's a, such a yeah. I mean, you want to talk about to somebody girls, that's you know? I mean, but yeah, I mean, he's he's kind of um, sequestered himself up in his house. I always make this joke. It's my my only bit when it comes to. Um, David Wilcock that he's turned into uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining you know like he's always out there just snowed in constantly losing his mind and talking to the Archangel Michael well um, <laughs> you know um, or yelling at his wife but I mean yeah it's just like uh, the and, and does he, he, really also, he also he also bathes in his own urine as well because it gives uh, him superpowers really mm. oh yeah Oh yeah, uh, see, I I have got like an extreme level of brain rot that I will sit and watch this nonsense, 
So he does like uh, quite a lot really of live. Seriously, so oh, sad. Okay. Oh yeah, I watched some of his live streams. Oh my and god! And it's so funny. I watched one like a couple of weeks ago, and he was doing like, it was almost like getting in a time machine and going into the 2020 election, right? Because he was doing the same stuff. He was pulling up all of the same screenshots from all of the same telegram groups about how there's going to be uh, a ton of arrests. The white hats are moving in. They're doing all of the secret oh, military God. arrests. And then we're going to go under a military dictatorship for a while until Trump sorts everything out. And then everything, the whole truth is going to be revealed to everyone. It oh, was like, God. I was like, get, you've had four years to come up with a new bit. Do something else. Be a bit creative. He's been creative in the past. He's written whole books full of nonsense. I don't know why he can't do it now. He's got you nothing know, but time. I mean, I wonder how many followers he still has. It sounds, you a know, lot. I mean, oh, Erica, they're in the they're in the super chat, and they they give him I, or one of the ones that I swear someone gave him like five hundred dollars, and he'll have like six, seven thousand people watching him at any one time, oh. and it was just maddening to me. And one of the things that really like. I mean, I've I've never, never, ever believed in David Wilcott whatsoever. But one of the things that was so telling was when co all of the Corey Good depositions came out and he was talking about just how much money they'd made through their TV shows on Gaia. Um, and also through their TV shows on Gaia, they'd promote all of these courses that they do, Accelerating Ascension, Ascend With Me for $300. And Corey Good said that David Wilcott was making like, I can't remember what it was like. It was at least a million, a million, maybe two million on one course. Ugh. Can you imagine? And these, uh, you know, no, these aren't, I can't. These aren't, <laughs> I these like aren't to courses, imagine. you know. They don't, work, it's worth something, but. Yeah, they're not like wow. a kind of, they're not like a com comprehensive curriculum. You know what I mean? Like it, it's literally like PowerPoint presentations talking about it's all just repackaged, descended master teachings from every theosophical offshoot group that's ever existed. And then they repackage it. They put a little bit of like QAnon into it. They put a little bit of ancient aliens in, a little bit of disclosure. They sell it to people, people who I don't, I don't blame anybody for buying it because I, I think that the people that buy well I think that the people that buy it are like the majority of people have kind of been led astray and well, they're kind of desperate yeah you know and, what and I mean? it's and I easy to fall that. into it I mean it is sad because I I feel you know and I've said this a million times like I do feel for people that are being given information yeah you know to that isn't helpful for them and um grifting like that it is really detrimental to people yeah. and it, it is um Absolutely. sad that you know you're promising you know i'm mean, here here the, the person that probably donated five hundred dollars that could be the last money in his bank account or exactly. her bank account and that is really um a problem and it's it's amazing that the authorities have not really dug in to that and investigated their schemes no. um hopefully they will at some point in time but it is. But he did it, he did, Corey Good's got all of his lawsuits that are apparently all. That I'm going off on a bit of a rant now, but yes, I, was reminded of all, I was reminded of all this today because I went back and kind of revisited my Alternative Three documentary, and um, I saw. I think I think their name on Twitter is Light Warrior. They have been like putting out loads of information on Corey Good, and um, but apparently there is. Um, the the court cases that Corey Good put against Gaia and a, a few other people are probably all going to be kicked out is is what i've heard and and he's not going to be able to get any money but i mean that the whole field is just like you who's know, representing him danny sheehan oh. <laughs> <Can you imagine? laughs> the ufo lawyer yeah That's just just wonderful wonderful people involved in this oh my gosh it's it's, it's but it's insane when you think about how much money these people can make yes. and, and sometimes it just makes you think like you know you, like you said like the work that we do right that you're doing being an archivist preserving history doing your ufo shows speaking to people creating expanding frontiers you know work that i do creating documentaries the work that other researchers and, and writers do actual things that are worthwhile but really we could just create a course out of thin air and then charge people 300 dollars for it 
Right. And we probably probably make money from it as well. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I, but clearly I have missed my calling and I've, you know, I've, I've talked about this too. Like I've never, you know, been one to like, I don't, I have a, a, another job. And so I can't spend all, you know, all the time that I would really need to get my numbers bumped up on the show and to, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things, yada, yada. And so I just hope that there are good people. I know there are good people that are watching you know, what I'm doing and putting forward and then learning something from, from that. But I refuse, um, you know, I'm just not the type of person and neither are you and neither is anybody in, in chat here tonight, the type of person that would have no conscience and be exactly. able to do, to do that to people. And, exactly. you know, unfortunately here in Utah, we're, we're quite well known for <laughs> our little Ponzi schemes and, and different things. And it's, it is pretty sad to watch, but. Yeah. Absolutely. My God, I feel like I've been on a big, a big rant. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> so let's get into, um, starting expanding frontiers. So you, it's you, um, Barry Greenwood and, um, Jack Brewer. Right. So how did, how did expanding frontiers kind of come about? And so what is I... expanding frontiers for somebody that isn't, that has no idea well, I just happen to think it's incredibly amazing. Um, it is Expanding Frontiers was started, was formed by Jack. Jack approached me a few, maybe two and a half years ago. And then I approached Barry and we started, went through the, the process, which was pretty exciting to start a nonprofit. And we had decided, you know, then that we wanted to do, to combine our work with the archiving, um, Jack's exceptional work with FOIA requests and grammar requests, and we wanted to create um, a nonprofit that was doing kind of that investigative work, preserving history, and um, getting information out to the public, and on a, a wide variety of topics. It's not just the UFO topic. Um, we want to definitely expand into more uh, things involving um, environmental issues, especially here in Utah, because it's a Utah-based nonprofit. Um, and and Amazing. things like that. It's um, it's it's been an, an amazing thing. And if if people haven't gone to our website, expandingfrontiersresearch.org, please go there and look at some of the the things that we have in our archive because it is incredibly impressive. And if you want to also really do a deep dive into the history of the subject, the involvement of the intelligence community, the involvement of um, people that are not who they say they are, there is a great. All of these things are are documented and put in um, in our online collection. Absolutely. So it's been, it's been just a, a great collaboration. Um, Jack is, and thank you for that. Yeah, Jack is, is a brilliant partner. Um, we work really well together because we have, each of us has strengths um, that we rely on. And then if there's a weakness, like on my part, that's where Jack will step in or vice versa. And so I think that um, it is, it's been, probably one of the, the most fulfilling projects that I've done in, in my life. And we are just getting started. The FOIAs that we have, you know, that we're working on right now are pretty interesting. We just got um, the police reports from the Salt Lake City Police Department about Joe Firmage and his arrest. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, those of you who um, aren't, you know, don't really know much about Joe Firmage, he was a uh, very brilliant at a very young age, was a tech entrepreneur and founder of US Web. And eventually that kind of branched off into Novell and things. He grew up in Utah. His father was a very well-known uh, law professor at University of Utah and um, very well respected. And in, so it is kind of sad to see um, you know, Joe, Joe step in and he lost all of his um, money and then has been involved with many grifts over the years. And now he has just been charged with and appeared in court. I watched the hearing on Thursday. Um, it watched, you know, he, he um, basically um, abused an elderly woman, drained her of her finances. Um, and, it, and then after his arrest, as stated in the police reports, he had a friend, um, John J. Tulip, who kept calling and trying to harass her. And then when you do uh, a, a search into this this person, this person was charged with um, child trafficking back in 2015. 
Christ. Oh and God. so it's, you know, it's ugly. This is what I'm saying when you get behind the scenes and you do some digging and it's like, these are the people that we're holding in high regard. Yeah. And, you know, for whatever reason, I, I remember maybe five, well, I guess it's probably been five or six years ago. I met through um, a reporter here in town, some of the people that had been, were alleging that uh, Firmage had built them out of a lot of money and then had conversations with people and, and realized pretty quickly that this was um, a very kind of a dangerous, these were dangerous uh, people, situations. Um, mm -hmm. So, but those are the things that we try to get to the police reports. So you can go to Expanding Frontiers and that's on the, the latest blog. So, so just for, for people that, that, well, I'm assuming that most of you watch my channel because you're here, but um, for, for at least one of my upcoming videos, um, Jack helped me, is helping with many FOIA requests. Um, and he helped me actually get a very successful FOIA request recently um, for a video that I'm hoping will come out towards the end of April about a missing persons case. Um, from the 1960s so as eric has said like the expanding frontiers are not just a ufo organization it's very much kind of like i, I would say you're like the researchers organization you know like you're you're there to support other researchers but also to kind of um you know as you say preserve history but the yeah, document is excited about working with you oh you know, the I think that's great that's what we want to do you know and yeah. to help somebody you know, with your um, in intelligence and passion and the way you put things, your documentaries together. I mean, that's just, it's such a, it, that is what we love to do. And so it's just fun to collaborate with people like you. And these documents that he managed to get via the FOIA request completely changed the game because, uh, because like, to, to put it, I won't give too much away, but before he managed to get these documents for me, it was, I was just going to kind of sum up uh, a a part of this investigation in just a sentence but he managed to get at least 60 pages i think it is of documents that give me so much more that i can quote from and i can now do like a whole like 20 minutes just on those documents alone which is right. so interesting to me That's and so it's cool. also he's also helped with the with them um, with some other FOIA requests um for some other other videos about UFOs and some about um, religious cults as well. And thank you to Crawford um, for the generous super chat. So glad that Erica is very anti the political extremists that took over MUFON. Gives me hope. Gives me hope um, as well. So in your archive, um, you managed to, um, or you were given and ruffles files so for, for i'm gonna keep saying this i can't find any other way to to word it but for those that don't know who and ruffle is and the importance of her files just kind of give us an idea of who she was and and what is in this archive that you you are now the holder of yeah absolutely and if, if you don't mind really quickly i just want to go back and address um a couple of things that i'm um seeing in chat with regard to the new alleged owner of the ranch. Um, he oh, has yeah, been you. very, um, of the, some of the first things that come out of his mouth is that Fugel scammed, uh, or excuse me, that he was scammed by Joe Firmage. And, um, you know, I think given the fact that things like Safe Moon uh, uh, and some research that we've done um, have been called into question, um, those people involved with Safe Moon, which was they, it was being promoted by um, the owner of the ranch, and they're now in uh, prison. Um, it, these are interesting things. So was that really, is that just a cover story that he was scammed? I don't know. Um, but I think that we were to the point where we have enough evidence that we should be questioning um, things that are said in that mm -hmm. regard. So that's, I just wanted to say that and throw that out there. Um, so thank Absolutely. you. And now to Ann Druffel. Um, Ann yes. Druffel was a, a good friend of Gordon Lohr and they worked together back in the NICAP days in back in the sixties. And Ann was a California researcher and was very um, active in, in a lot of different organizations. She was a part of MUFON. Um, she headed up the NICAP, you know, one of the heads of the NICAP group in California. And she also wrote a book called Firestorm on Dr. James McDonald and his contributions um, uh, into the UFO subject. And so 
and she wrote many books, um, some on, on abduction. She had have the Rex Heflin photos, the infamous Rex Heflin photos, and did research and um, on on the this. And then I'm you know just have to say that I'm literally like ten feet away from all of these documents and mm -hmm. tape recordings of her interview with Rex Heflin. Um, all of these things are it's just incredible. And so when Gordon. Um, when Gordon uh, had understood that um, Anne had passed away, he reached out to Alice Struffel, um, who's been on my show. Alice is Anne's daughter, and said, you know, I know this wonderful woman that would take very good care of, of Anne's files. And so I, I established a, a relationship with Alice. She's a lovely, lovely um, person on many levels. And I had to get the money together and go down very quickly. Um, to her house, so I flew down, uh, rented a U-Haul truck, and then put, there were, I mean, upwards of 80 to 100 banker boxes stuffed full. Wow. Uh, I mean, it was, the whole truck was packed. And these are like, you know, one of a kind documents. These are typewritten. These are documents that have seen the light of day between maybe two people. And we're talking about exchanges with Kehoe and some mm -hmm. of the members of, of NICAP and, and Stuart Nixon and some of the lesser known people. I mean, I've got, you know, Christmas cards from Heineck, um, just all of these really interesting um, things and research projects that she did. And then two huge uh, drawers, I mean, of, of all of the, the work, the 10 years of research she did about James McDonald right. and photographs of, you know, his, his garage photographs of, his vehicles, um, all of these, these things, um, that, you know, I'm in charge of, of taking care of and scanning and, mm -hmm. and archiving and getting out to the public. And so that's been just like the coolest thing for me. Like, I, I don't think there's a day that goes by where I don't go back and like, just sweep up an armful of documents and then, you know, just go in there and, and read. And she was, she also liked to collect, um, news articles. And so I've got all of these really random um, stories about UFOs from um, publications in Latin America, you know, all, and nice. all over. And it's just like, it is so cool. And then she had a considerable uh, book collection with, you know, some of the books behind me mm -hmm. that have been signed um, by, you know, Jacques Vallée and some of the big wigs in the subject. And mm -hmm. Gordon Lohr also donated his, um, his files to me. Um, and so that has just been a really neat compilation of people donating and creating a space where people can come in and visit or ask me um, questions about specific things that I have. And I love it. I think that it is very difficult to become, to be a woman in the field of UFO archiving. And I definitely know that I um, have, you know, had some experiences where, um, I think the old guard has been pretty dismissive of me because I am a woman and I think they've been quite certain members of the old guard have been quite blatantly disrespectful, uh, to be honest with you. And I would not, that's obviously not, you know, Barry Greenwood because he's a good friend of mine and on the board, but, um, I think most of the other people, they have their, their group of people that they want to have their little echo chamber. They don't want a woman involved because a woman is clearly lesser than a man. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's been, been a challenge. And I also think I want to say about the archiving too, while I'm on my little rant, I think oh, it go is, I love your rant. I, yeah, <laughs> so, because we've got some coming up right now, but, um, <laughs> I think, you know, like the, the fact that there is no cohesion in this community yes. and it's a very small community is, is, is pretty sad to me. Mm -hmm. There's not, you know, it's, it's all about, we're going to, sweep up all the data and put it in one location. Mm -hmm. And then anybody else that's trying to do that is just either a problem or not going to be acknowledged for the work that they're doing. And I think that um, that's unfortunate. And perhaps at some point in time, I will um, you know, delve into that topic and a little bit more and name some names. I had a, had a couple experiences that were very unsettling and, and, um, you know, you should absolutely name some names. You don't have to name them now. But. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you're, when you're good and ready. Well, I will. I will just say that. Yeah, I, I was pretty disappointed by some some groups that like to gather a couple times a year, mm. um, and 
Um, yeah, just it's ridiculous. And I also want to say too, with regard to like the the archiving, you always have to, in my opinion, it's really important to know the person who is doing this, that their motivations. Is this to sweep up all the information to make sure that we're keeping the bad press at bay and tamp down? Like I know some people in the archiving world have done yeah, because they're so desperate to prove UFOs are real. Um, and, you know, is the motivation to prove UFOs are real? Because if that's your motivation for creating an archive, then you have no business having an archive, I in my opinion, agree. because yeah. you obviously have no, um, you know, you're not grounded enough or you, you have motivations that are not. I think you have to be new, at history. least neutral about it. So like if you get, say, you know, if you get a, a researcher's archive, you have to be able to look at that with anything that that it shows. If it throws up a case that you're like, oh my God, I, I never believed in this, but this is like, this seems to be something then you need to be willing to go with that and vice versa. There needs to be like, it, it, it just has to be about what the evidence is. Right. You know, and I think that the interesting thing is there is a lot of, a lot of these researchers had very, um, you know, very interesting beliefs, um, you know, very um, extremist beliefs. Um, mm -hmm. And that, in my opinion, did, cloud um their work but these you know it, you need to when you're do, preserving history it's the whole thing whether it makes you uncomfortable or not because that shows where the person is coming from how their data could be skewed um and i just think it's you know you have to get all of it out there um i understand oh, yeah. that with the the Heineck, um stuff that there has been kind of a need to make sure that that Heineck's sterling reputation um, is kept that way for the sake of the UFO subject. And again, that's unfortunate because, you know, his correspondence and different things um, should, you know, see the light of day. And Absolutely. if his, you know, if, and his motivations, I mean, it's just, that's, I think there's an, there's a lot of rewriting history and the UFO topic has been the prime, a prime example of, rewriting history and suppressing information. I completely agree. It's still going on. So I got the um the opportunity to go to uh Gray Barker's archive in That's West so Virginia. Cool. Yeah, in in like uh I think it was the first of November last year. And I'm going back in May. And the guy that runs it is great. And it is, it's not digitized, but it's open to the public. So if you just contact him via the website, let him know when you're going, he will find a way to accommodate you. And it is just like, I never visited an archive before for research and genuinely blew me away just how much there was. And the, the amount, I mean, there was like a stack like that high of just stuff related to the one topic that I was interested in. And that was in one like drawer uh, uh, that was filled with a bunch of other stuff that on one like filing cabinet that had like five other drawers next to another five filing cabinets. I mean, it was insane just how much stuff there was at Grey Barker's archive. I was like taken aback by it. Um, and it's like, there's so much history there like an insane amount of history, especially with somebody like Gray Barker. I mean, that guy was like talking to everyone. He right. was communicating with with literally any anyway. You send him a letter, he would he'd start talking to you. And it's like it, just the amount of information that's there, and it is just such a valuable resource. It is, you know. And I think to you know some of the things that I've talked about that we try to to talk about and have done records requests for with regard to some of the influence of, of um, you know, s some subversive groups mm -hmm. <laughs> the, that have been always right there in, in the subject, but just nobody wants to to look at it or address it. You know, I think those things are, you know, when you, you have the opportunity to see people's files and you can, you know, just see the things that go on behind the scenes, I think those are really important to put forward. And I don't understand how people who want to preserve the subject and really carry things forward in a positive way, how they would, you know, they could reckon, um, 
with the idea of, of, you know, whitewashing the subject and not putting all this forward. Absolutely. So I think it's, yeah, it's interesting stuff, but I would love to go back there oh, and look through his stuff as well. Just, just like, yeah, it, it's phenomenal. I can't wait to go back just to kind of like, I, I'm going back this time. It, when I was there for the first time, I was just mostly interested in any communication there was with Morris K. Jessup which there was a lot there was a photograph there was even a photograph in there of his body on the slab in the in wow. the uh, in the coroner's office they had um Carl Allen from the Phil good guy who created the Philadelphia experiment conspiracy slash hoax slash story whatever you want to call it and they had his passport in there um all of these photographs um, cuz he he would he would say Carl Allen would send his um passport out to people he'd send people like his ID and so it's all very bizarre but they had just so much stuff just related to this one topic that I was researching so when i go back in may i just want to go back with, and just be like look i'm just going to take everything look try and look through as much as possible because i feel like even in even like where you least expect it you'll find something interesting yeah absolutely and you know that's it is you know interesting to see um people come here and look through you know the the archive here and and just to see what their focus is and a lot of it's just been on ufo cases and you know to me i mean that's all fine and dandy uh but i mean there's so much more to this topic and i think it's also you know, a kind of a shame that people in academia um, don't understand the importance of this topic and what has gone on over the decades. Um, I think people are starting to. I know the University of Utah has a special collections up there that is just off the hook, and that's where Dr. Frank Salisbury's work is. Mm. I've spent a lot of time up there going through um, his work, and it's just, it's very important that this information is put in, in places where, where people can have access um, to that and we'll Definitely. see what happens. But I was, um, I started to do some um, local research, kind of Steve Berg got me down this, um, this rabbit hole of like doing um, more kind of like local um, kind of things that are in, in my town. And I managed to uncover like so many, well not uncover, but found out so many strange things about strange characters that had, that had lived in my town so I didn't know but Hugh Dowding um lived like just up the road from me and he was oh. very much involved in the Tombridge Wells Flying Saucer Club which is not oh. the town in which I live just FYI I live close to there I'm not doxing myself but I don't <laughs> live in Tombridge Wells Good for you. Um, but, <laughs> but I was interested in whether or not anyone had archived kept anything from the Tumbridge Ross Flying Saucer Club because this was one of the most like I mean they were very very active in like the 50s and 60s they had George Adamski come and speak there Desmond Leslie was there um uh what's his name Clan Carty um loads of people and they were very 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 active and I wondered he was uh Dowden was He's listed in a few newspaper articles as being like the the president of the Tumbridge Wells Flying Saucer Club, and I know that the RAF Museum in London has um, like his correspondence and archive. But I was going to call them and find out whether or not they had anything there. But I was thinking that like what uh, it, they must have had so many different pamphlets, leaflets, correspondence. They were all corresponding free letter. I just wonder what happened to all of that. Who has it now? If anybody actually has it, or or whether it was like gotten rid of, because I think uh, unfortunately in this field a lot of people kind of just get rid of stuff. Right, and I I think you know I know that there are people that don't want to you know they with the pamphlets or flyers and things like that they just want to throw them out and I'm like please send those yeah. to me because yeah. that to me like what they're promoting is really fascinating and so um, and again it's like one of those pieces of the puzzle that you know really says a lot about motivations mm. and stuff but that's really cool i hope i get I to you wanna... see you sometime oh and oh, um don't know whether or not whether you want to address that or whether or not whether you can address it it's totally up to you if you don't want to <laughs> um well you know i would say i could address it but i choose not to 
right now. Okay, that's that's that is all we need to know for that. Yes, and I hope that I can come over to um Salt Lake City and go through. How much of the of the archive have you managed to get through? Because there's so many boxes. Have you have you oh, looked God. through everything? At I this have point? looked through everything. Yeah, right. um, because I just love it. I'm the biggest mm -hmm. nerd. It's like okay, yeah. let's go. You know, go do something fun. No, I'm looking at my UFO stuff because I'm a nerd yes, and I fun. totally yeah. done with my nerdness. But um, <laughs> but the scanning, you know, thing takes a, it takes a, a fair bit. Um, there are a lot of the older um, sheets of paper are very brittle, and mm -hmm. so some so instead of running things through a scanner, unfortunately, you've got to prepare the documents, take out the paper clips or take out the staples, and then do any uh, repair work, and then scan some of it by you know one one paper at a time which is very tedious um i did a fair i've done a fair bit of it but there's a lot more to go and that's why i'm hoping people will donate uh to expanding frontiers because there are certain things that we need especially like with the cassette tapes or the vhs tapes you know we need to get um specific types of equipment and then a better uh you know scanner like barry greenwood has things like that those are yeah. important to the process um and so hopefully that will happen i'm gonna have to make a trip out you do me because oh how, we minutes. could you could have some fun times in salt lake or in we would just end up we just end up like camping out in where you're at now like your your, your studio with the archive but then i could just... take you on you know tours that's you true. Know, around. That is very true. I don't know where I'm going to be in the Utah area, but we're definitely going to have to make it happen. I'll pull some strings. Good. Uh, That'd be so much fun. I would I'll love talk, to have I'll, you. I'll talk to some people, create some plans. We'll, Do we'll it figure out. I could take you on a little tour if, uh, you know, a ranch. That'd be great. That'd be great. Have a dirt I farm. Think, yeah. I think that'd be fantastic. You could see some really um, cool security guards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Christ almighty. Um, just want to shout out to uh, Sarah in the chat. Sarah is uh, my old uh, colleague and uh, old roommate whose uh, grandma saw a UFO. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about abduction experiences and um, whether or not, like, first of all, kind of your where should we start with this? Let's start with your overall opinion on like the phenomena of, of alien abductions. And then the you, I know, I know it's kind of a bit difficult because there's a lot of different cases, but just, you know, your vibes. Um, and then your thoughts on the use of hypnosis in relation to abduct abductees and how prevalent it is in the UFO world. Um. You know, the, the abduction phenomena, I mean, it, it, it is a very um, complex subject and it, it's, it, it is very interesting that stuff like this didn't really start to um, come out. I mean, we had Betty and Barney Hill, you know, back um, way back when, and then you didn't really hear a lot about, you know, abductions. You had Travis Walton, um, mm -hmm. people that were hoping to get paid by the National Enquirer for their... <laughs> UFO abduction tales, things like this. Um, but then, you know, you've got, you know, communion and Bud Hopkins really coming into the scene and and Bigelow pulling strings behind the scene and and all of these these things and people that were um, you know, hey, let's go to this hypnotist. We're, you know, going to you know, a hypnotist with really no I mean, no credentials. I don't know where people Hey, great! I'm a UFO expert, so I know how to hypnotize you. But basically, yeah. they all end up leading um, the person that has, has had an alleged encounter, um, or they do what they did in Emma Wood's case um, with Dr. David Jacobs. And you can go to Expanding Frontiers Research to read about Emma, and she has graciously donated um, a lot of her material to Expanding Frontiers. But um, you know, it's a fascinating. <laughs> Go ahead. But for the for the people that are watching that don't know who Emma Woods is and about her experience, I know that she's been on Expanding Frontiers before, and you you've you and Jack have spoken to her extensively. Um, but I, I yeah, just just a little idea of, of of what we're talking about. Yeah. So Emma, um, this is her pseudonym, but she um 
is a, a lifelong experiencer of the paranormal phenomena. Um, and then she got involved with Dr. David Jacobs in 2002 and um, discontinued her interactions with him after some, some things happened that were quite alarming. Um, and those tapes, you can actually hear those audio tapes on the website as well. Um, mm -hmm. And she still um, is, and I, I need to talk to her. I haven't talked to her for a few months just to check in. But she was obviously very alarmed um, by what happened with David Jacobs. And I'm amazed that actually people still include this man in their circles. But um, so who, is, who is J David Jacobs? Uh, Dr. David Jacobs um, was working at Temple University and he was working with Emma and had conversations with her about her abductions. And in one really disturbing conversation, asked her to send her panties. Mm -hmm. um, him to be analyzed. Um, and just really some of uh, just the, it, the conversations are heartbreaking. So he, and was like, he was hypnotizing her over the phone, right? Right. Like a long distance hypnotism. And wouldn't he say things? Um, he, he, he asked her or, or essentially while he was hypnotizing her, um, told her to go and buy a chastity belt because she was having experiences with uh, like the paranormal. And um, he said, that it wasn't it something along the lines of, if you wear that, they're not going to be able to do anything to you. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, again, those are like such, you know, triggering um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> encounters, um, uh, you know, so yeah. The whole um, thing had like a very kind of like, predatory it was sexual absolutely slant to it that he absolutely. and this is like the big problem with abductees or people that um have experiences in the paranormal is that they are take out of your mind whether or not you believe that it's real or not a lot of people are experiencing something and or have had these you know kind of things that have uh, that happening to them be it psychological or or paranormal or whatever and they look for help and they find people like dr jacobs who on the face of it seems like a highly credentialed person and um he is not he is a predator, a predator who took advantage of somebody that was incredibly vulnerable and um, through a series of hypnos hypnoses over the telephone, essentially exploited um, exploited her. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, just it, incredibly um, disturbing. It, it's, you know, and that's what, um, you know, and, and, you know, to me, having had my own personal experiences um, with domestic abuse, um, to see the the level of um, depravity and and so many things that we're not even getting reported, I, I would love. I think it would be really interesting sometime to um, file records requests for police reports that were made in the area of, of a local conference and yeah. see what type of types of things are are taking place. Um, and and I think that could be very interesting. But it is sad because you do go to these conferences and you're, you, you think, you know, you, you're, this is great, you know, around kindred spirits and we're all asking questions and then very quickly you can become um, part of a grooming process and you can be handled and manipulated. And I, I think, and I say this so much, I know you've heard me say this a million times on my show, mm -hmm. but like to wake up early in the morning at a conference and hear, um, see all these, you know, wonderful people in a room and they're being led through this hypnosis session and they're being told that they are, are here to save the human race and they're special. And I mean, just all of these things are so completely um, not based in reality. I mean, it is it to me, that's really alarming. And I yeah. think that anybody in the UFO world that is claiming that they're an expert at hypnosis, I would say just really please run and don't don't even get involved because it's it's detrimental to your mental yeah. health yeah yeah absolutely and the fact that predators like david jacobs who 
who, you know, people still turn to him as some sort of credible voice on hypnosis and abduction. It's absolutely not. Incredibly unethical. And, um, yeah, just just deeply disturbing. Right, and that's... And, and I think the thing that's so interesting, too, like I had mentioned earlier, it's like it's fascinating that people in the old guard are still friends with him. Um, they look the other way. And I think in a lot of ways, some of the people in the old guard um, have done a lot of damage um, by not speaking out about some of the groups, you know, like the NICAP email list being sent to a Nazi twice, yeah. um, you know, people not talking about some of the, um, the fact that people are um, harming children and, you know, and, and bringing these people, holding them in high regard and having them speak at conferences. I mean, I just think, you know, this subject, this community has a lot to answer for. And, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I think, I think this day, this, this day will come very soon. Because, I hope so. I, I and hope it's so like, too. it's, it's, you know, and you also look at, so recently all of um saucer smear which i mentioned earlier was um uh scanned and put online and i was i don't even want to say i was shocked because i wasn't shocked but after wendell stevens uh, got out of prison so wendell stevens a uh, very um well-known ufo researcher put that in in uh quotes um wrote a series of books the, all of the ufo contact books um that now go for like hundreds and hundreds of pounds and he wrote a lot of those um he was also a um a pedophile um a convicted um pedophile went to prison for it and as soon as he came out of prison he was um accepted with uh pretty much open arms um at UFO conferences and written about in um, Source of Smear as, as though it, he just had a kind of run-in. He just had a run-in with the law. Um, it was just a, just a misunderstanding. That's how it was worded. <laughs> yeah, just just crazy. I mean, it's, it's just like uh, horrific. And then you put, again, you put those kinds of people in a situation at a UFO conference when, again, you've got a lot of people that want to believe, right. a lot of people that believe that things, the, that paranormal experiences are happening to them. They have that true belief that it is happening. So they're in a vulnerable state to be taken advantage of. And those are the people that they they are um, being around right. at UFO conferences. I mean, he's not around anymore, thank God. But there's a million people like him, like, you know, Stan Romanek, for oh example. Oh, my gosh, yes. And, and Jan Harzan. Yeah, you know, I'm not the, sure who that is, you know? actually. Um, so Jan Harzan was the executive director of MUFON. Right. And he was involved in a, um, they were doing an undercover sting, um, and he was soliciting underage um, girls, and that kind of has disappeared from, from the headlines, um, and it would be interesting to to find out what what is happening with that case and things. But um, it is very uh, alarming, and and seeing you know doing what I was mentioning, seeing the police report, um, and thank you uh, to the Salt Lake City Police Department um, for doing that so quickly. That was wonderful. But seeing um, this fellow that's this that's involved with him and knowing what he had been. Um, involved with it's just it's just it's heartbreaking and it makes me angry and it should make all of us angry and we shouldn't you know I, I often ask some of the people not so much anymore because I'm on the b list which I'm happy to be on the b list because mm -hmm. I'd rather be on my b list than be on that a list for sure um, but I think you know I've over the years I've asked people what can we do to make this subject better and safer well it's the way it's always been it's the way it will always be and I just think you get out of my way because you're the problem. You know, yeah. if, you, if you don't have the integrity for the, the top, if you don't want the topic to advance and you're willing to remain silent about the abuses that you know are happening and, you know, just so you can get your next lecture, you know, and be invited to a conference and get on coast to coast, then, um, you know, that really doesn't, bode well. And I think that yeah. this subject will, I think we are right now, we've got such a great core group of people, you know, and I'm so happy to know you um, and support you and, 
you know, just I really think the world of you. And this has been really important for me as a woman and as somebody who's been in, in this subject, just kind of spitting in the wind for so long and had to deal with all of this on my own. So it mm-hmm. is really important to know that people like you are there and like people in, in chat that we have, we are creating, we've created a group of like-minded people who will stand up, will ask questions. And we are going against a group of people that have a lot of money mm-hmm. and are, you know, every day we see new groups popping up and they've got all these subscribers and they're um, doing what they need to do to market their subject or whatever they're doing, but we are creating a community and I'm very proud of all of us for doing that. And hopefully a younger generation that comes into this won't get sucked up into the UFO Twitter drama and into the David Grush uh, nonsense and things like that. And that we will be able to continue to educate people on the true history of the subject and really create the change that this topic uh, and the people involved uh, deserve. Absolutely. I could not, I could not agree with you more. And on that point, I did want to ask you what research is that you would recommend when it comes to the field? So just say you're a, think back to like young Erica. (laughs) And young Erica, unfortunately, um, f- you know, g- got kind of wrapped up in the in the kind of you know the grifters, and you know, you had to learn who not to trust and the bad actors of ufology. But who are the people that you would go? Here you go, Eric. Here you go, young Erica. These are the people that you actually need to <laughs> need to be listening to. You know what? I mean, I I will always say that like I love um, Erling Strand. You know, I think what they did over in Heshtalan was so cool. And I was really fortunate to be able to go over there. I'm not hundred um, percent was... familiar with, with it. it was, was, is that like, a, I'm going to try and get this off the top of my head. Was that sort of some sort of like, so it was something scientific to do with paranormal. I can't remember exactly so, what it was. You know, it's really cool. And I know we're getting to the show close, but I'll try to do this very quickly. So oh, no, that... we can talk for as long as you want. Okay. Keep going. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> You're like me. It's like, I just keep on talking. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm so glad that people hang in there with me. But um, so back in um, the eighties in this little sleepy village in Norway, people were seeing objects, um, balls of light, different things, um, very up close and personal, and they were quite alarmed by it. And so they went to the media and then the media descended upon uh, the village and there a lot of, I mean, you know, a thousand people came, ripped up the, the place and, and left trash everywhere. And then the people that were promoting or, or saying that there were things that were happening were ridiculed. And Erling Strand, who uh, was, is, I, I think he's retired now, actually, um, working as a professor at engineering at Oxford University College, got a group of people together and just said, hey, you know, we're scientists. These are things that we should be addressing. And so he obtained funding and they went out and did, I believe, a seven-week research project and came back with... Um, enough evidence they felt that they could, and they did. They got further grants. They had 35, 40 years of of funding, either from the government or from private donors. Um, They created a a system over there in the valley where they had different centers for communications and monitoring data. And they've got one specific place called the Blue Box, um, where different teams from of scientists from Europe will come in and bring mm-hmm. instrumentation and monitor for specific things. And, and it was, you know, I got to go over there during science camp. And so they get the scientists, the kids from um, kids, grandma Moses is speaking um, the, <laughs> the people in the engineering college and they'll take them out there for two weeks um, a couple times a year, and they will go up to the tops of different mountains and set up their tents and set up the equipment and in very harsh conditions and then collect data. And so it was really cool to see. It was, it was, they were so gracious. Erling was wonderful to me um, to sit at a table with, you know, the head of the French space agency and, um, you know, some of the brightest scientists in, in Europe was really Um, just an experience I'll never forget. And to see the way that they were using science 
to come at an issue, which we should. I mean, that's that's what we've got. It's, and you know, that's what they should be. We should be doing here in Utah, but um, not not so much. Even they're not doing science. <laughs> no, around. we know shooting lasers up into the sky. They've got, do whatever they've got all yeah. the, but they've got you know like scientists there and do they all the, all the well they've got all the science equipment haven't they? science actors <laughs> <laughs> whatever but you know i mean so like i that was a really that was such a cool experience and to genuinely like to sit there and watch erling um lecture the townspeople and update them and 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 just say this is what we're doing this is the information that we've collected these are the mm-hmm. papers that we've written and um, it, it was a really like a one of the most profound, I think, moments, times of my life. Mm-hmm. And I got to climb mountains and I got to realize that my ski gear was not enough for the weather in Norway. <laughs> um, it was very cold, um, but I would go back again. It's just, it was lovely. And so I look to to people like that. Um, I think, you know, people like people that are preserving history um, are important. I think, obviously, I can't say enough about Jack Brewer and his contributions with his books and blogs about the subject. I think James Carrion is somebody um, that is is uh, pretty right on on many uh, things. So there are good people out there, and they're critical thinkers, and right. they're um, you know it is and it it can it should be this should be an empowering and a fun topic. Yeah, and because of things like UFO Twitter and because of toxic trolls that hide behind pseudonyms, the subject is, is not fun and can be very yeah. damaging. And so it is, you know, good to, to make sure you're finding sources, you know, like I, I mentioned, I think they're really some great people and, and Ruffle. I mean, she, she went through, I mean, she did, you know, so much. And at the end of the day, you know, and, and throughout her, her life, she, it was a believer. She had, you know, she went down certain rabbit holes, but the, the meticulousness of her research, I mean, I can't even say enough about that. And I think, um, you know, to, to know that she went through her life and, and at the end of the day, you know, her, her daughter asked her, you know, what do you think mom of this topic? And she said, you know, show me the body and show me the craft. Yeah. And so like, just to, to see, to read her work, to see her changing over over time, you know, that's such an important and powerful thing. And so my hats are off, you know, to to people like Anne. So absolutely. And on the flip side of that question, what researchers would you not recommend when it comes to this field? Well, honey, do you have five more hours? (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, I, you know, I think Bud Hopkins, um, you know, is is pretty interesting. I wouldn't, you know, put a lot of stock into some of the stuff that he did um, as somebody who wasn't even trained in the topic. Um, But I think, um, gosh, there, I think if you basically go and look at pretty much, you know, anybody that goes on coast to coast, you know, I mean, there you have it right there. Okay. That's true. Oh God. But I used to love that show so much. I know. I know. And now you just now. Well, I still kind of do. I I still like, I've I've got like a nostalgic kind of, I never listened to it live because I live in England and I'm, you know, I'm however old I am. I'm not going to give away my age, but um, I I never listened to it live, but I've still got like a, a a kind of love for it. I think it's, it's it's like it all being history. I mean, it yeah. really yeah. is it's interesting. It's interesting to it watch is. the way the UFO or conspiracy culture, paranormal culture was, I mean, they, and they were brilliant in the way that they approached things. You know, you're getting, you know, the truck drivers working late at night, you're getting, you know, all of these this different group of diverse people across the country. And then, yeah. you know, you're throwing in the aliens, you're throwing in all well, the FEMA camps and then, a little Roger Stone never hurt anybody, you know, things, yeah. things like that. And, and um, so I just definitely, you know, I don't know. I think yeah. I would say, I would say that 99% of the people that are um, out there in, in a real big public sense on this, I don't mm-hmm. have a lot of credibility. I don't, I don't believe are very credible and are clearly promoting fictitious narratives, whether they're delusional or whether they're just scam artists. Um, I don't know, but yeah, yeah, I just, the people I mentioned, those are the good people. <laughs> True. And if I've forgotten a couple of you, I really apologize, but. 
I've got a couple more questions, but if anyone has any questions um, for Erica, please put them in the chat and um, try and get to them. I wanted to get your feelings on like, um, to kind of not really ab abductions per se, but um, contactees specifically. And you don't have to comment on this if you don't want to. But I thought it was interesting um, because... Uh, I want to talk to you about Chris Bledsoe because I know that you've you, you've spoken to Chris Bledsoe. You mm. interviewed him on mm. UFA Classified, and um, also James Carrion, who is now you know it, he is definitely on the much more skeptical um, side. He was um, Mufon. Um, was he Mufon director he was at the time of Chris? Yeah. director. Yeah, and he went to the Bledsoe house, and he was part of that discovery the Discovery reality TV show that was the first time that the Bledsoe case was kind of in, in the mainstream media and Chris Bledsoe hates that um, TV episode. So I, I, wanted, I wanted to know if you've got uh, any thoughts or opinions because he's very much like, you know, he's he's kind of like the um, uh, Tanner, a Tanner Boyle um, who writes Getting Spooked says he's uh, the Georgia Dampsky for our, our age. He's that kind of you know, contactee figure? Um, you know, I, I spent many years having very long conversations with Chris. Um, and I will say he's been nothing but but nice um, to me. With that said, you know, it was, it is interesting to go back and look at my, the notes I've taken over the years and to see the common themes and the, the people and the stories that were being promoted. And for me, knowing what has been promoted over the years, I don't have, you know, I don't know how credible um, that that is. Um, so he's very much kind of surrounded by um, intelligence figures from in intelligence communities, you know, like uh, Colonel Alexander, John Alexander is very much kind of like hovering around him. Um, you've got like Tim Taylor, who appears in the Diana Pasolka. Um, stories um, and it takes on this very kind of like bizarre religious uh, slant to it. It's right, just, yes. The, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting how they've combined a whole lot of a lot of things, um, you know, just to, I don't know what that's about, but <laughs> I, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, you no, no, I just, I don't you. have, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't find a lot of that credible, most of it, all of it, any, uh, you know, I mean, I, I can't, you know, if, if Chris genuinely believes, you know, he has seen these things, I, that's, that's great for him. Um, I do, like I said, find it interesting to see the people around him, the stories that have been told about others and these circles and, and things, and just to see the way, you know, I think there are, groups of people in this subject that have their own special narratives. And mm -hmm. so they're all working together to spread their own special narratives. Whether, whatever the purpose is, I, I really don't know. Um, but it's, a lot of it just doesn't uh, jive. Do you think that he could be being exploited by those people who, who've got their own narratives? You know what, I think that you he very well could be exploited, um, um, being exploited by them. Um, but I don't know, you know, that's a million dollar question. Mm -hmm. When, when is somebody being exploited, um, smart enough to understand they're being exploited in a big way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, is Tom DeLong being exploited? The jury's out on that. Or is he just a, you know, whatever he's, yeah. you know, I don't know who knows. <laughs> Sometimes but. it's hard to say. Um, Jackson Paul asks, any book recommendations, Erica? Well, I definitely say The Greys Have Been Framed, uh, Jack Brewer. I think um, I love uh, Jack Brewer also wrote a book on NICAP and the history. And the, um, you know, I love his books. And I'm trying to remember the name of Carry On, um, the, the book that Carry On wrote that is completely escaping me right now. Do, um, do, uh, is it Roswell Deception? Yeah, I think there might be one. He did the Rosetta, um, something. Oh my gosh, I'm totally bad, you guys. I'll yeah, I'm I'm forgetting this. it. <laughs> um, I'm telling For you, sure. it's 
Well, there there's a days. lot of books, to be there, fair. I mean, there there's are a lot, of, a lot books. of books. I think, um, like, I love, um, oh, my gosh. I'm just trying to think here. I, well, God, I've got, like, 500 in, in behind me <laughs> and 1,000 in front of me and things that I think they're, I would only reserve brain space for, you know, a handful of those books. Um, like I said, Jack Brewer, amazing. Both of his books are great. Um, I think Barry Greenwood, well, I know Barry Greenwood and Larry Fawcett wrote a book, uh, Clear Intent, mm -hmm. that was about their journey doing FOIA requests and government secrecy. That's a very important um, book to read as well. And also Andruffle, uh, Firestorm is a great recommendation. So those are our books that I will definitely awesome. recommend. Awesome. Well, I think, I think I've, we've kind of covered a lot in in the past two hours it's just kind of like flown by i'm sure we could talk about a, a million million other things but i've kind of gone through all of all of my all of the things that i definitely wanted to hit on tonight but um we should definitely um do this again because i feel like we there's just so much more that we could cover especially with like especially with like you know all of the the uh, I mean when we didn't even talk about David Grush and much and the disclosed you know the Arrow report and all of that other stuff but maybe that's a um another time um Space Cat Luna asks are you available to contact by email um yes there if you go to Expanding Frontiers Research there is an email um listed and so you can reach out to that um and I will contact you I will respond and I will leave Thank all the you. links um, to uh, Erica's YouTube, um, to the Expanding Frontiers Patreon, to the Expanding Frontiers website. We can go through and look at um, look at some of their archives. And yeah, it has been lovely to hear a female um, perspective. Too few and far between, and we do need to change that. But hopefully, yeah. um, Thank hopefully you. we are. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming on, Erica. I really appreciate Thank it and you. giving me my time, giving you, giving me your time. That's it. I've forgotten how to talk. I get to like yeah. the two hour mark. Well, I know you're up late too. I don't know how you do it, but bit. it's been yeah. lovely and I support you. Well, the, and... clock, the clocks literally just went forward. So like now, instead oh. of it being 1 a.m., it should be 1 a.m., but now it's actually just skipped forward to 2 a.m. So I just oh. lost an hour. So I good, really am up good late. Good luck tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I live I live on like American time, so I I I don't wake up until like twelve one p.m. Oh, perfect. Which is probably really great for you know like vitamin D deficiency and whatnot. I, I think I could use a little bit of that too, vitamin D. <laughs> but the vampire lifestyle, it's great. But so again, true. thank you for your work, and I want to have you back on my show, and I'll come back on your show, and Absolutely. I want to also just say thanks for the great comments. Again, like yeah. you have really respectful, intelligent listeners that follow your work nice. and i think that's that's fantastic that's what we need absolutely thank you. well thank you for coming on and thank you everyone and i never know how to end these things so i'm just going to end the stream thank you goodbye Bye.